Good evening, everyone. My name is John Herron. I'm the director and chief executive officer of the Kansas City Public Library, and I want to welcome and thank you for joining us tonight for a very special evening program. Today is National Disability, Disability Independence Day. It commemorates the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, the world's first comprehensive declaration of equality for people with disabilities, as President Biden called it in a proclamation he signed just yesterday. We're going to talk in, about in the next hour or so about empowerment, as well as impairment, blindness, that fortunately in many cases today is more surmountable than it is a disability. That is in no small part because of the work of organizations like our partner tonight, Alpha Point. Here in Kansas City, the Census Bureau estimates that nearly 40,000 people have vision difficulty. That's about one in every 12 residents in our community. Nationally, 32 million adult Americans either have trouble seeing, even when wearing glasses or contacts, or are blind or unable to see at all. Alpha Point has served that community since its founding in 1911. A national nonprofit headquartered in Kansas City with a facility in New York. It manufactures tens of millions of products annually and is one of the largest employers of people who are blind in the United States. More than half of its 400 plus employees are visually impaired. It also provides comprehensive vision rehabilitation services to thousands of children, adults, and seniors. Alpha Point has produced a compelling new online series entitled Foresight that we will preview and discuss tonight. Their very first episode features David Patterson, blind since childhood, who served as governor of New York from 2008 to 2010. We are honored to have him as part of our program this evening. Now, I want to introduce Alpha Point's president and chief executive officer, Reinhard Babry, who will lead us through our discussion and preview of Foresight, as well as a panel discussion that includes Governor Patterson. Reinhardt has led Alpha Point since 2006, a tenure that has seen the organization's revenues grow by more than 300%. Those are resources that translate directly into more jobs and more services for people who are sight impaired. Reinhardt has also served as president of the National Association for the Empowerment of People Who Are Blind and as chairman of the Kansas Advisory Committee for the Blind and Visually Impaired. We are very happy to collaborate with him and Alpha Point tonight to mark the 32nd anniversary of Americans with Disabilities Act, to explore and discuss the dignity, the respect, and the opportunity that is due to all in Kansas City and America who are blind. Well, please join me in welcoming Reinhard Mabry. Thank you, John. Uh, appreciate very much your welcoming remarks. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge uh, KSHB anchor Ray Daniel, who couldn't be with us tonight due to a family emergency. She was supposed to moderate, and you're stuck with me. I'm sorry about that. I ask everyone to please keep Ray's family, uh, the Ray family, in your thoughts and prayers uh, tonight. Uh, Alpha Point is a Kansas City institution founded more than 110 years ago by people who are blind. The blindness community organized themselves to address the challenges they faced, which are housing, transportation, and employment. While technology has opened doors of opportunity, these challenges remain. With the help and generosity of the community, Alpha Point has grown into one of the largest manufacturers in Kansas City and one of the largest employers of people who are blind in the nation, employing people who are blind in manufacturing, retail, call centers, and other lines of business. Alpha Point is also the only comprehensive provider of rehabilitation and training services to people who are blind in our region. Each year we serve more than 3,000 people who have recently lost their vision or who are experiencing life-altering changes to their vision. Young and old come for services that ensure they remain independent and have the skills and confidence to thrive in modern society. Alpha Point wanted to create this 
program that transcends the perceived divide between the sighted and blindness communities. Foresight gives change makers within the blindness community a platform to share their experience, their insights, and their wisdom. This is the only program of its kind. Ultimately, we hope people around the world will watch or listen to Foresight because they find the conversations instructive and motivational and perhaps lead to greater understanding and inclusion for people who are blind throughout our country. It's fitting that we're gathered here tonight for this program, program given that the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed into law 32 years ago on this very day. Despite the tremendous impact of the ADA on accessibility, the unfortunate reality is that employment, the employment rate for people who are blind or have other disabilities remains well above 70% across the United States. People with disabilities are not discriminated out of malice, but instead because of a tragedy of low expectations and misunderstandings that hampered them in the job market. How can we fix this problem? I'm excited to hear what our panelists tonight have to say, but I'd also ask that as you listen, think about how you can help. Tomorrow, when you go to work in your organization, or perhaps when you volunteer for an organization in the community, I'd like each of you to go and ask the question, does that organization have a member of their board of directors or a person in their leadership who has a disability? And if they don't, I'd ask you to challenge them to rectify that and to open up their organization's leadership to a person with a disability. If every organization in the country, both in the for-profit and nonprofit sector, had representation from members of the disability community, it would reduce the misperceptions that exist in the marketplace. I firmly believe that the unemployment rate for people with disabilities would decrease significantly if we all accomplish this one simple task. Now I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to our panel this evening. The first and to the far left is David Westbrook. He is a crisis communications consultant and an Alpha Point Foundation board member. In fact, he's the chair of the foundation. David Westbrook has devoted his lifelong career to service as as a marketing and branding consultant to various Fortune 500 companies, national nonprofit foundations, and agencies of government. Most recently, David served as Senior Vice President for Strategy and Innovation at Children's Mercy in Kansas City. David serves on several for-profit and not-for-profit boards, and we are fortunate to have him as Chair of the Alpha Point Foundation Board of Directors. David became the first alum to receive an honorary doctorate from the School of Arts and Sciences from his alma mater, the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Please welcome David Westbrook. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Robbie Mackinnon, a community leader. A leader in the Kansas City community for more than 20 years, Robbie has served the citizens of this region in a number of capacities. Most recently, Robbie served as the president and CEO of the Kansas City Area Transportation Authority, where he oversaw the dramatic transportation transformation that brought five different transit systems under one umbrella called Ride KC. His leadership expanded accessibility for people with disabilities throughout our Kansas City region, and we are so very grateful for that. Prior to serving in the transportation sector, Robbie managed the Learning Center and Program Development at Ozanam Children's Services in Kansas City, which is a treatment center for children with behavioral and emotional challenges. Robbie received his undergraduate degree from Northwest Missouri State University. Please welcome my friend, Robbie Mackinnon. And finally, on screen, I'd like to introduce you to Governor David Patterson. Governor Patterson was the 55th governor of the state of New York, serving from 2008 to 2010. In doing so, he became the first African-American governor in New York history and one of just four African-American governors 
across the nation in U.S. history. He is the first blind governor of the state of New York and a one of only two blind people to have ever served as governor of a state. Prior to becoming governor, Governor Patterson was the first African-American lieutenant governor in New York history, which came on the heels of serving in the New York State Senate for more than 20 years, where he became the first non-white minority leader in state history. Governor Patterson earned his undergraduate degree from Columbia University and his Juris Doctorate from Hofstra. And I'm very fortunate and thankful to welcome Governor David Patterson. Thank you. So we're going to begin viewing foresight clips momentarily, but I'd like to begin with a question for each panelist. And I'm gonna sit down, but I wanna just start here and ask, can you each explain the circumstances surrounding your vision loss? And let's start with the governor, please. With me? Yes, sir. So I was born in uh, 1954 and I was um, diagnosed with Tay-Sachs disease when I was eight months old. Now, I am not Jewish. The, most of the people who have Tay-Sachs disease are. So clearly that was a misdiagnosis. And then they found out that I suffered from optic atrophy. Optic atrophy is scar tissue between the retina and the optic nerve. In my case, it deprived me of just mild light perception out of my left eye. And my right eye the vision is something like 20 over 400. And so um, uh, I've had two problems. One is extreme nearsightedness. And the second is difficulty with depth perception. And so, uh, be, so it is a legal disability in my case. And it uh, enabled me to uh, gain a, a certain number of services. What's unique about my diagnosis is that almost all babies that were diagnosed with optic atrophy, particularly in the 40s and 50s, and there were a lot of them, were because of overheated incubators. Therefore, the incubators itself were burning the tissue between the retina and the optic nerve. I was never in an incubator. There are some other cases, very few, where the child had optic atrophy, but no one knows uh, its orientation because um, I was not born premature and I was not incubated. Thank you, Governor, I appreciate that. Uh, David Westbrook, how about your experience surrounding your vision loss? Thank you. Um, well, I will tell you my story is a pretty baby boomer stereotype. In the 1950s, I was growing up playing baseball with Roger Maris and Bob Serve in the Kansas City Athletics and Mickey Mantle of the New York Yankees. I wasn't playing with them, obviously. Thought I could be when I was 10 years old. And uh, when I was 10 years old, I was in fourth grade, and uh, I was pleased to be reading at the uh, senior level in college. And I was a, a, a bright kid and really cared about learning and cared about playing. And by the age uh, of my sixth grade year, in school, my, that grading proficiency, that grade reading proficiency had dropped to eighth grade. And I was beginning to demonstrate behavior problems. And the fact is I couldn't see what was on the blackboard, but too ashamed to admit it to anybody. Uh, my parents had gone to doctor after doctor in Kansas City, finally found, found a doctor who had been associated with a Mayo Clinic, and I went in one day and the doctor said, you know, we have a, a diagnosis here that looks like glaucoma. Glaucoma is a disease that uh, kills the optic nerve because of fluid that goes into the eye, does not flow out of the eye as it should, and lubricating the eye as it should. So instead, the fluid builds up pressure on the nerve and kills the nerve over a period of time, and you, can't, you lose your sight and you can't get it back. Well, I went to the Mayo Clinic, and on Monday, they, uh, I, I flew into uh, Rochester, Minnesota. On Tuesday, uh, met with the clinic. On Wednesday, confirmed the diagnosis, and by Friday, I was in surgery and would stay at the Mayo Clinic in the hospital there for 10 days, and then three weeks afterward as an, af af an outpatient. And that uh, uh, particular uh, operation was uh, experimental, and so was the second one, and the fourth, fifth, seventh, eighth, and 10th. I spent about 12 weeks of my junior high years in uh, uh, the hospital and additional weeks at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester uh, attending uh, sessions with as an outpatient. I don't say that to get your sympathy. 
I think it gave me a tremendous amount of opportunity to learn and grow. Uh, but by the time I was uh, in college, I could not see uh, at all. And today, I'm totally blind. I mean, not legally, I mean totally. I don't do things just legal, I do it all the way. I mean, <laughs> uh, my, my eyes, they're prosthetic and uh, they're beautiful because I got to pick the, pic the, the, the uh, color out, at least I thought, I, I think I did. My wife, Cynthia, actually picked them out. <laughs> and when I'm bored with it, I can change it, you know? So, uh, you know, for me, uh, that, that experience is what caused the blindness. Let me give you the punchline to the story. I was with uh, Children's Mercy for a while. And today, a patient with a juvenile glaucoma diagnosis can go in to get that diagnosis on Thursday, can go into the hospital for surgery with a laser on Friday morning, can come home on Friday afternoon and be back to school on Monday. And they are going to be taken care of, thank you. There will be no erosion of sight. And uh, so blades of steel have been replaced by beams of light. The laser beam is small enough that it creates a uh, a, a way for the drainage of that fluid that was causing pressure that killed my optic nerve. And the eye doesn't respond to that as an injury because the puncture is so small, the eye doesn't detect it, but large enough to get rid of the fluid. So that's research and that's progress. If you told me that I would have to trade everything I've learned from being blind and get my eyesight back as a part of the deal, I wouldn't take it. I say that today joyfully. So uh, that's my story. That's Thank how you, I got David. I appreciate that. And Robbie, what uh, the circumstances surrounding your vision loss? Very, very different type of experience. Yeah. Um, first of all, I am wow. I am so honored to be here with David Reinhardt and the governor. I, I feel like the uh, player to be named later, or like a seventh round draft pick <laughs> or something. So, but, <laughs> but I am grateful. Uh, I have what's called a ischemic optic neuropathy. Uh, I lost, about 10 years ago, I lost my vision. I lost one eye. And then uh, as I was going to the doctors, they told me, oh, it's okay because it hardly ever happens in the other eye. And then I won the lottery, right? Uh, so it happened. And uh, I also, you know, went to the Mayo Clinic and everything, and every doctor I went to, uh, they looked at me and then said, okay, where are your disability papers? I said, what? what? What do you mean? Well, where are your disability papers? I said, I don't need disability papers, I need help, okay? I, I wanna, I gotta get back to work, right? I gotta take care of my family. So that was interesting, and then, like you, David, I had a, <laughs> I had a, a, a lady and a couple other people come up to me at a conference and go, so, so, Robbie, are you actually, are you legally blind? Mm -hmm. I said, no, I'm illegally blind. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Thank you. That's wonderful. So uh, we're going to start with the first clip. Uh, this is Governor Patterson's experience with public education. And I'd just like to note that the person that's doing the interviewing is uh, of the governor is Scott Thornhill, who is Alpha Point's director of public policy, and he is the host of the Foresight program and is asking the governor questions in these clips. First clip, please. I'm curious, do you think, in looking back, do you ever spend time thinking how things might have been different, career may have been different, if you had? Uh, I think uh, that although it was a great idea to send me to public school, I came to the conclusion while in public school that the less I bothered anyone, the more appreciated I would be. So when, uh, you know, there was writing on the blackboard and I couldn't see it, I just either got a friend to tell me about it or just listened. And this is not a good way to get an education. And I think I was very um, unable to address my issues. I had an itinerant teacher, a teacher that was sort of like the prelude to special education, would come and talk to me once a week. We'd spend a period together. But I never really complained about anything. And this would be uh, a real problem for me when I got to Columbia and also when I got to Hostra. And at one point, uh, when I was at uh, Columbia, I went to a barbecue over the summer and a gentleman asked two of uh, another guy my age and I to go out and get him 15 kids to pack lunches for students that were going to, to uh, summer school or summer camp. And uh, we went out and we got 13 kids and put our names on the list. He hired everyone except me. 
And I didn't even do anything about it except get upset about it. And uh, I told my parents about it. They didn't seem to understand. Finally, when they did, they sent a little polite message to the gentleman. They knew him, but they didn't appreciate the way he treated me. And that's when he put the final knife in my heart. Scott, you know what he did? He hired my brother. Ah, oh, nice. Who was underage, by the way. So he broke the law twice. And I went back to Columbia, and this is a point where I lost self-esteem completely. I couldn't pick up a book. I couldn't concentrate because I thought, why am I doing all this work if, in the end, I'm never going to get a job anywhere? And uh, But for an intervention of a professor who saved me from basically getting put out of Columbia, and his idea was to have me leave the school for a year, and he said, this time, you go look for a job and you fight for a job until you get one. And then you can come back here a year after you started. And that was the best advice I ever got. And that changed my entire life. And it also annexed me to the idea of speaking for people who might have a voice, but don't use it. So Alpha Point uh, serves so many young people and we see uh, examples of young people uh, really retreating within themselves. And I'm curious, Governor, uh, as a follow-up to this uh, uh, clip, um, how did the notion of keeping quiet affect you throughout your educational experience? Well, first it started with issues related to my vision, <clears throat> but it's sort of like a disease. When you don't have any self-esteem and you can't speak up for yourself, I didn't speak up for myself sometimes when I was accused of doing things that I didn't do, uh, or perhaps if I wasn't feeling well in school, I just internalized everything and didn't, um, you, you know, you're, you're losing an aspect of your personality, that ability to communicate with others how you feel. And uh, I found that I would tell three quarters of how I felt, but not the last one. And uh, it took a very long time for me to learn that you're going to have to speak up for yourself and you're going to have to be very clear about what the problems are. Thank you, Governor. Uh, David Westbrook, I'm, I'm curious about how your education and work experience compare to the governor's in that regard. You know, I, I uh, was told by the school teachers that I had in junior high school, a couple of them said, this fellow shouldn't be here, he should be at the school for the blind. And uh, my mother at the time felt that would be a segregated experience for me, and that it would be better for me to be integrated in the public schools. Now, public schools were not very progressive when it comes to special education in those days, and the special uh, care that would be required for a special needs kid, uh, those mandates were not in place, and those programs were not in place. But uh, my mother was a great advocate, the principal was an advocate, and so they gave it a chance. And I, for me, uh, that experience was terrific because it taught me very early on that I would, as the governor just said, have to learn to fight for myself, in which I translate into develop skills in social negotiability. It's my job. It's not your job to be accepting of my disability, but it's my job to help you become comfortable with it very quickly for me to tell you what I need and what I don't. And after about two minutes of that sort of quick conversation, we got on with living our lives. And if I'd, not, if I'd not learned those skills in social negotiability, I don't think I would have had the career that I had or the joy that I've had in my life. Thank you, David. You know, Robbie, you're listening to the governor and David's experiences and obviously had a much more traditional experience in education. But um, do you have any thoughts as you think about your experiences and whether there's, where there's alignment? Yeah, sure. What was different for me is that uh, I lost my vision, like I said, about, I'm 58 years old, so I lost it, what, nine, 10 years ago. So I was already, you know, pretty far uh, into my, and it's, it's, it's fantastic to hear David talk the way he talks, because that's the way he first talked to me, okay? And it was fantastic. I can tell you that David Westbrook and Reinhardt Mayberry saved my life. Too kind, uh, very much so. No, um, no, no hold on. I don't, hold on. I'm good. Uh, the, the thing I would like to say about that, though, is when, when, you know, when, when that happened to me, what they taught me, I, I don't know. 
One of the biggest things they taught me, perspective. Before I went blind, I was that guy, right? I was, uh, I say this all the time, I was ambitious. I wanted a bigger house, a bigger car, a better job. I climbed over whoever I needed to climb over to get there and all of that. And then I went blind. And what I try and tell everybody is to, to get a piece of perspective, right? Nobody ever gets perspective until something traumatic happens in your life, right? Your father gets Alzheimer's, your wife has a lump on her breast, you go blind. Then all of a sudden, my, my wish and my prayer for all of you is to get it ahead of time. Because what that showed me is that the only thing that's important is my wife and my kids being happy and healthy. That's perspective. That's what they pulled me through and taught me. So just a little different. Thank you, Robbie. The second clip uh, is Governor Patterson becomes the governor of New York. And then the day, the day came, right? The, the day came. <laughs> the day March came. March 10th. March 10th. 2008. So tell us just a little bit there. I know you've spoken a lot about it, but, it, but I, it's such a great story. Tell us. I just uh, went to work. And uh, it seemed a little strange. They said that Governor Spitzer hadn't gotten to Albany. And I'm on the third floor where the halls of the legislature are, but the staff work on the second floor. And my staff has noticed that none of his staff has showed up, and he hasn't as well. So I'm, you know, working there, and, and they asked me to cover an event for the governor, and I did that. And then they said, the cardinal is coming at 1 o'clock. We need you to be there the governor can't be there. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Has everybody here lost their mind? That is protocol. It's head of state to head of state. That would be as if the Queen of England came to Washington to see President Bush, and he doesn't feel like seeing her, so he sends Cheney. And uh, then I added, but in that case, he was running the government anyway, so it might have been appropriate. But here it's not. By the way, <laughs> President Bush laughed when I told him that I shared that story with him once. But... Uh, I um, find out at about five minutes after one this incredible story about a prostitution scandal. And I've been told that you will be governor at 2.15 p.m. It's now 1.05. So I, uh, my father, who I called, uh, suggested to me that I contact the other state elected officials. And I call them all up. And the one that calls back first is the one I thought was the most busy. Hillary Clinton, and she said to me, uh, there is something very ominous about this call, David. Is something wrong? And I said, well, Senator, I guess it's wrong, but what's going to happen is in about a half hour, I'm going to be sworn in as governor. Oh, my goodness, what's happened? And I said, no, uh, the governor's fine. It's just that he's going to resign. And she said, well, why is he resigning, David? And I guess I didn't answer quickly enough. And she said, David, why is he resigning? And I said, to myself, how do you explain a sex scandal to Hillary Clinton? <laughs> and so that fortunately, uh, the governor postponed his resignation uh, and allowed me a few days to, to organize so that I could, uh, you know, yeah. to, to, with very little time to prepare, assume the role of governor. <laughs> <laughs> well, Governor, that, that was a fun little moment. Um, but, but not only were, you, uh, were the circumstances of you becoming governor challenging, but you, you were also dealing with a once-in-a-generation economic crisis. And I'm just curious how you managed to handle that enormous burden, uh, given you were really just thrown into this role rather quickly. I guess I um, didn't really know that <clears throat> until uh, right before I was sworn in as governor. My budget director came in and some of the other analysts, and they said, Governor, we projected that there'd be a $5 billion budget deficit. Now, that's a lot of money, but the state had uh, reduced that in budgets before. They said, however, between the beginning of this year, which was 2008, and it's now late March, we believe that the budget deficit is going to expand 
to $10 billion a year, which would be the largest deficit we ever had. Inevitably expanded to $21.3 billion a year. It was the highest escalation of a budget deficit experienced by a state in the history of this country. And guess who comes in to try to close it? And it, it was very difficult because I think when I was first sworn in, I probably got the biggest ovation any governor ever got. Part of it was because I was a legislator and legislators love when a former legislator becomes governor, but part of it was that the former governor was leaving. So, you know, it was kind of like ding dong, the witch is dead and everybody thinks that I'm gonna be this benevolent governor and I tried to be, but I did point out that we were gonna to have to severely cut a lot of the agencies in order to close that deficit lest the state start to go into insolvency and no state had done that since Arizona in 1929. I sure didn't want to break that streak. So it was just a very difficult time. And what happened was I wound up governing antithetically to how I would have governed if we'd had resources. So my friends, I mean, people I knew very well turned on me because I was pushing to close this deficit, but I don't think they understood the ramifications if we hadn't done it that way. Thank you. Now, David Westbrook, you have a few experiences with crisis uh, management. I'm just curious, uh, uh, have you had any experience where you suddenly found yourself in the position of managing a significant crisis? Well, you know, it's interesting to me that, that I learned pretty late in my career that my credibility in crisis management consultation came because these chief executive officers with whom I would be in consultation were men and women who basically had at one moment pretty much anything at their disposal, lawyers, accountants, advisors. They had a crisis and they were unfamiliar with how to manage a legitimate, real, authentic crisis. And one of them told me at one point, you know, after the crisis was fi finished, he said, you know, the reason I took your advice is because you had gone through a personal crisis, and I figured you knew how to deal with this because it was familiar to you and not to us. Now, he was giving me way more credit than I deserved, I can assure you. I wasn't giving that client any advice that any other skilled professional in this particular space would have given that person. But, bingo, got it, okay, that's an advantage, all right, use it. And so I did, and it was a, it was a blessing <coughs> that, the, that these folks would, would be able to assign that kind of uh, uh, personal experience and bring it to my uh, career experience. I also, though, gained a tremendous amount of confidence from that comment, because I was able to sit and talk to these big shots, and they really were big shots, uh, man to man, woman to man, man to woman, very, very honestly and authentically. And um, what a lesson and a blessing that was for me. Thank you, David. So Robbie, I, I, I know you've had a, a long career. Of course, I've, I've known you as, uh, as managing the KCATA and, and the bus system, and I imagine there were a few crises that come to mind there as well, but is there a crisis that you can uh, point to that, um, that you suddenly found yourself in and how did you deal with that? Well, sir, I, uh, I know my wife Marina thinks every day with me is a crisis. So, <laughs> I get, so I love you, honey, thank you for putting up with me. Um, yeah, I mean, we can talk about any number, number of things, but I think COVID was, uh, was a huge deal, right? And what what everybody here knows uh, is that, look, if you're going to be a leader, uh, if you're going to hide behind a rock, your team's going to hide behind a mountain. Okay, so, so uh, my father taught me a long time ago that, okay, you don't have to be the smartest guy in a room, Robbie, just surround yourself with the people who are. So that's what we did, and our ability to be able to show leadership and a leadership team uh, with 750 employees who were all scared to go to work every day, right? And, and you wanna talk about frontline workers, our, our drivers and operators are frontline workers, right? And, and them putting themselves in that kind of 
uh, situation just to help the essential people of this city to be able to get around and keep this city breathing was absolutely amazing. So, you know, uh, I and my team and I made them, we ran out there and we were, you know, we were spraying down buses, cleaning buses. We were uh, right there with them and, and that's where we had to be. But again, like I said, you know, you hide behind a rock, your team hide behind a mountain and, and I'm not gonna do that. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit now. We talked a lot about what these folks did and how effective they were as leaders in times of crisis, how they dealt with their own crisis of circumstance. I wanna talk about how the media and people might portray people who are blind or perceive people who are blind. And this next clip, Governor Patterson talks about how he was portrayed in the media. It seemed as though you were not only treated unfairly, maybe when it came to sort of how you handled the, the budget deficit, but, but also with your vision loss and how you navigated that. Can you talk to us a little bit about your thoughts, you know, Saturday Night Live and others and how they sort of portrayed you and how you, how you handled your vision loss and your, your use of, of skills in that regard? Well, throughout my career, my blindness was kind of an asset. People talked about how I was able to overcome these disabilities, how I had uh, handled it in the legislature and that kind of thing. But it seemed as if the minute I became governor and the one of the heads of uh, the National Federation of the Blind, Carl Jacobson, said to me that uh, the problem is when you get in charge, people now worry that your disability is impeding your performance and you shouldn't be there in the first place. And I got a lot of that. Uh, there was a major uh, figure in my administration. He was my secretary, who was the governor's chief of staff. He had to resign. The New York Post writes an editorial called The Governor's Eyes and how he was always reading to me and now I didn't have anyone to read to me and this would be a problem. There were 200,000 people on the state payroll and the last I checked, all of them know how to read. In other words, it was not only vicious, it was ignorant. So then, of course, I think these articles, there was another article that I had made a statement, uh, don't worry, we will be building at ground zero. Now, I knew we had started building, but it was so minuscule that people were afraid that the 10th commemoration of the uh, attack on the country on September 11th, we wouldn't have anything there. Uh, so they write an editorial, someone should take the governor down to uh, the site and let him touch the building so he'll know that, we, we've, that his administration, they've already started building there. And this culminated on December 6th of 2008 when Saturday Night Live does this, uh, you know, this kind of uh, caricature of me who's not only blind but is stupid the sort of Mr. Magoo character, walking into walls, holding maps upside down, unable to communicate well. And uh, my press corps laughed and said, we're gonna write, that's really funny. Now let's let the governor come on and speak for himself. And I refused to do it. And um, a few, not enough of them, but a few of the disability organizations came to my defense after that. and. Uh, it, you know, took me back to times I was ridiculed as a child and that kind of thing. And I put up with it for about two years. And finally, a very good friend of mine uh, said to me, listen, David, uh, you did the right thing. You fought Saturday Night Live, but they've offered you a chance to go on there. Now go on there and get even with them. And so I did. I went on and they apologized to me. And I said, you all made so much fun of me for being blind that I forgot I was black. <laughs> <laughs> so, Governor, did it feel good to get a little revenge? Come on now. It really did, but I have to admit, I did hold, I did hold a map upside down once. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, David Westbrook, uh, do you have a similar experience in which you've been portrayed unfairly or people have made false assumptions about your capabilities because of your blindness? Oh, I think the stereotype certainly has been assigned to me and it's been the other side of the coin, which I uh, have to confess in my early years loved it because of my unbridled ego. 
Uh, and that is that the only way you can overcome uh, blindness is by being a genius. So every so, so many years, maybe 10 or 15 at the most, the Kansas City Star would, be, would do a profile. Where is he now? What's he doing? Is he stumbling yet? Uh, is he still doing these brilliant things that only a genius can do? And it's, I think it's called overcoming genius bias. The only way you could possibly overcome blindness is if you have overwhelming special talents. Like Ray Charles, you can play the piano. Or Jose mm -hmm. Feliciano, you can sing and play the guitar. Uh, or you can be brilliant in some measurable way. But the rest of you guys who are blind and don't have the gift of talent or genius, you're sunk. <laughs> and that's, well, just, that's, that's just not true. So genius bias was what my experience had to be with the media, and I finally got to a point where I could talk to the media and get my ego out of the way so I could talk about issues that are important to um, challenges that are associated with a physical or a mental disability and, and how opportunities are there for people. But again, you got to know how to deal with that challenge, not only with the restrictions that are placed on you because of a limitation, but also how to become socially adept at negotiating your way through a sighted or mostly able-bodied society. Thank you, David. And Robbie, your experience is a little bit different because yes. you, you lost your eyesight <laughs> and you had to go through a transition and we're learning how to, to live uh, independently and live with these, with, with basically blindness skills. So how did you deal with, we, did, with were you portrayed differently when you lost your eyesight? Does, does, any, does anybody read a paper around here? <laughs> no. no, I'm not gonna do it. I, I promised I wouldn't do it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a good friend of mine, uh, Mayor Sly James told me one time, I got, I, I got upset because we thought we had done something very special and, and uh, there were others who were, uh, I would get notes sometime when I first started uh, down there and it would say, we need to get back in our lane. You, how can a blind guy run a transit agency? Uh, those kinds of things. And it was Mayor James who came to me one time and he says, well, look, Robbie, here's, what, here's the way it works, all right? We go, you and I will go out on a corner, we'll hand out $20 bills. This many people will say, thank you. This many people will say, what's the catch? And the rest of them will say, I wanted a 50. <laughs> and, 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 that is, and that is the way <coughs> that, and, and that is the way that works. So just get used to it and keep pushing forward, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, what I always told my staff and what I tell my kids is if I can put my head on the pillow at night and know that I affected people's lives, that I have changed the perspective, that I have changed uh, uh, something, then I'm all good, right? So no matter what the crisis is, no matter what the, the, the you know, people talking against you, and uh, if, you, if you go there, uh, it's just poison, all right? So why even go there? Again, you know, why, why do you get up in the morning and why should anybody care? And if you can tell yourself, like I can, that I'm helping people and that I'm affecting people's lives, then I'm good. Awesome. Thank you very much. So this next clip um, is a question for the governor and I think a hopeful uh, tone is, if you could change one thing about the future for people who are blind. Uh, as a foresight question, we, we ask a foresight question for our series. If you could change one thing uh, about the future for people who are blind, what would you change? I think that I would, uh, in a lot of the service organizations, really spend more time on the individual's actual feelings about themselves and about life and, and, uh, and uh, periods in their life. So for instance, one of the big problems for all disabled students is after high school, because they might actually intellectually be able to handle the material but the socialization around it, many uh, disabled people are sort of separated. I remember I was probably the most popular kid in the class, but uh, 
eighth grade, freshman high school. I don't remember when it happened. Somebody had a party, and I knew him well. He didn't invite me. He didn't see me as part of the social, uh, you know, community in the school. He saw me as a, uh, a, you know, an academic. And so this kind of typecasting really hurts, particularly young people, because young people, you know, mistreat each other, bully each other, cast system each other. And uh, I think what I would want is for the service uh, organizations to really start working with the socialization of the students as much as the academics, because it's extremely important to the human psyche that somebody feel uh, like they have value in all areas of, of living. I didn't really feel that way. Feeling of value, that's tremendous. Um, Governor, as a follow-up, an enormous part of, a, of any person's future is their education. What do you believe needs to happen in the educational setting so kids who are blind aren't left behind? Well, I think it... <laughs> kind of relates to what Robbie was saying about himself, that when he puts his head on the pillow at night, he feels he's done something to uh, help people and that kind of thing. And so clearly he feels a part of uh, the organization, organizations that he's been in. And I would say, I, I don't think I ever would have thought this, you know, when I was in my early 20s. I'm proud of the fact that I'm blind. I've, I've lived a completely different life then I probably would have lived uh, as a sighted person. And who knows, as a sighted person, my life might have been more boring. There's never a dull moment in my life. I open, try to get the door open to an Uber today. The guy rolls down the window and he says, I'm not a taxi, governor. <laughs> so he knew who I was. And I said, oh, so you didn't know that um, governors have gone into carjacking now. But actually... <laughs> What, what I'm, uh, you know, trying to point out is that life should be exciting. Life should be fun. People should feel good about themselves. And I think that uh, in the uh, in the systems of education, but even outside of them, uh, some of those recreational opportunities they have. Now that I did have when I was younger. Uh, on Saturdays, it was a guy. He. Took uh, it was four of us, four or five of us were all males, and he took us fishing and swimming and showed us these aspects of life that maybe our families were afraid to expose us to. So, and what I think it inevitably builds is that feeling of of pride. Um, it, it obviously is is flattering to have uh, served in some of the capacities that I have, but I think the most flattering is when other blind people talk to me and tell me that it motivated them. Because when I was their age, I was looking for that motivation and couldn't find it. Thank you, Governor. David Westbrook, if you could change one thing about the future for people who are blind, what would it be? Oh boy, that's, um, I, I, I certainly think that it's tough when you lose your eyesight later in life rather than earlier in life. Um, and so I think I would, in, it, I would heighten the opportunity for people who recently encountered a, an irreversible visual disability of some sort to have exposure to and time with folks who've gone through it and who are very comfortable with it. I've told people that if I got my eyesight back today, I'd have no reason to tell anybody. I mean, what would... <laughs> What, what possibly would be the advantage for me to tell somebody that? And, and I really feel that way. And so I think, uh, you know, we, you, we need an opportunity when you, you lost your eyesight, you need an opportunity to have that. And I also go back to uh, job interviews for a second. Um, when I was going on my college campus in the spring of my senior year, here I had a virtually a three-point grade, a four-point grade point average, and all these student achievements and school newspaper editor and head of the student council and all this stuff. And a guy from Dun & Bradstreet says to me, I didn't want to work for them, but I wanted the interview experience. He says, well, now look, if I, you've got a very impressive resume. If I hired you, how would you read your mail and go to the bathroom? <laughs> now that question today would be illegal. Uh, but then, at least he asked me, you know, and of course then I was a, an abrupt 1960s 
generation kid, and I said, are you asking me how would I do that at the same time? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> uh, and that was irreverent, but I learned that I had to deal with that stuff, and today that question would be illegal, and here's the problem. The interviewers who are conducting those kinds of interviews have that, I, that question on their mind. It's on their mind, and the question today is not how would I, how would you read your mail, but the question is if I hired you, how would I fire you? That's why we don't get jobs. That's why the 70% rate is up there like it is. Fact is that employers are okay with how you look on the resume and it seems you look good, but geez, how in the world would I fire you? And so we've got to teach folks who are well-educated and have gotten training and are ready to go for a job how to really conduct those interviews to overcome those issues so that they get the opportunity uh, that they deserve and I think part of our future uh, for people with disabilities is to include that skill in the course. Yeah. Thank you. And Robbie, how about for you? One thing you could change about the future for people who are blind, what would it be? Well, um, I'm, I'm gonna go the other way. Uh, I'm gonna tell you that what, what, what I hear from the governor, what I hear from David, and what I hear from a lot of other people is uh, a pride, okay? A, hey, I, I'm, I'm glad I'm where I'm at. It's made me, a, and, and that's true with me too, it's made me a better person. It's made me a better husband, better father. Uh, it, it just has. So uh, in that same respect, what I would say is, you know what? I wish everybody else could be blind for 60 days, right? Because if you were, then you'd feel like we do, right? The, the overwhelming freedom of meeting people and not judging them by the color of their skin, the kind of clothes they wear, how they look, what kind of shoes they have on, but just what you hear from their mouth and what you feel in your heart and your gut. And that's an amazing place to be. And if everybody was like us for a little while, this world would be a much better place, I guarantee it. Awesome. Thank you, Robbie. So this next clip, we're going to talk about employment. Go ahead. In terms of uh, Alpha Point specifically, so, you know, we, we have a wide range of jobs. And that's one of the things that we've tried to do is meet people where they are. Um, you know, some people have, have gotten a higher level of education and, and maybe they want to pursue a job that's IT related. But not everybody is, is at that level, either in education or in other skill development. So it's one thing we've tried to do is have jobs at all different skill levels so that um, not that someone necessarily stays where they are if, if they want to grow, then they can do that. Do you see that as a, I mean, as a, as a positive way of approaching that situation with people with vision loss? I think that... Um uh, in, you know, in terms of an effort made by an organization yeah. that if you can meet the skill level and find jobs for people who have that uh, skill level, you've wiped out a long process of training. Uh, then uh, correlative to that would be that you would um, want to recognize the areas that people need to go in and they don't really have the training and try to identify ways to give them the skills and training that they would need to to hold those jobs it's um it's a very interesting dynamic and frankly the fact that we're even talking about it right now when uh we still have large unemployment in the deaf population nearly 90 percent and uh, even in the blindness population at you know uh, over 60 percent and and for other disabilities as well, I um, think about the fact that if a if one of the government agencies actually dedicated the, themselves to employing the disabled and in this case the blind in areas where it could be you know extremely helpful, I think it would send a message to the private sector as well. Thank you, Governor. I think that's a great comment. I do want to ask you, though, as a follow-up, how could we overcome the barrier to employment for people with disabilities within the private sector? Because it really is a, a dilemma, isn't it? 
Yes, and you know, the government websites until 2015 were totally inaccessible to blind people. And uh, finally, uh, some company came in and they created a, not just a screen reader, but a, uh, an element that interprets uh, what the user is looking for and then reads it back to them. And I believe it was the board of, it was the elections website that they, was the first one that they changed. And I believe the social security one has changed. And I don't know what the progress has been in the last few years, but the government responses at times have been appalling. This would be the easiest way to generate opportunities for people to work if they could even locate where the jobs are. Thank you, Governor. I appreciate that. Um, so that we're staying on time, I'm going to go to the next clip, if you don't mind. Um, and I appreciate your comments on this. Um, what does the future look like for people who are blind? Next clip. How do you see the future for people who are blind? What, what do you think that looks like from a technology standpoint, employment? What does that look like to you? Well, one of my fears about the future for any um, group of people that is now um, making their way is that external circumstances can impede it. So obviously during COVID, it impacted uh, people with disabilities to a greater extent, um, the same kind of services uh, to, to some mm -hmm. degree were impaired just because of the government's budgetary problems and also just the issues of, of uh, distance yes. and cool. travel and, 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 and the like. And so what I think um, can happen now is that, that we get refocused uh, none of the government websites had real accessibility for the blind until 2014, 2015, which is a shame when they, when they finally um, uh, made the Social Security website and the Board of Elections, uh, National Elections, um, uh, accessible at that particular time. So from a governmental perspective, we've got a long way to go because it's just a, a lot that's, that's not available. And then you have uh, people uh, like myself who got to a point where there was just no assistance in some of the areas that we studied in or the areas that we were trying to work in. And you just have to, you know, find creative ways to try to solve the problem and you can't always do that. So, but I think the outlook is very positive because uh, you know, now uh, we had a woman run for lieutenant governor in Maryland as a blind person, as a Republican, the same time that I ran uh, in New York. And you've got people uh, with other disabilities, uh, uh, you know, rising to the highest levels of, of government. And with that is, I think, a new understanding of how to interact with people who have disabilities. I think the most important thing is whoever you are, you have to be proud of it. So it's not like I'm proud of being David Patterson. Oh, and by the way, I have this blindness issue. I, I'm proud of that too. I'm proud of the fun that I can make of it. I'm proud of the fact that in spite of the times that it worked uh, very much to make me feel uh, that I couldn't achieve and and some depression that probably came with it at the time, but the fact that I was able to get over it. And I'm proud of the other people who are in these situations who realize that life can be better and, and work hard to do that. So if you can be proud of uh, your heritage, you can be proud of your race, you can be proud of your religion, you can be proud of your national origin, you can be proud of all the things about you that make you who you are. Tremendous. Thank you. I want to bring I the other two panelists. I apologize, by the way. What's that? Um, I said I apologize. I did this interview with Scott, I think, last October, so I didn't remember how I answered the questions then. So, uh, you know, I've gotten on in years, and I can't remember these previous interviews. <laughs> well, I think you did pretty well. So I, I want to bring the other two panelists in just before we open it up to the audience here real quick. Um, first, uh, Robbie, with respect to mass transit, we're talking about the future. What does it look like for people who are blind? 
What does the future hold for people with low vision and for people with other disabilities with respect to mass transit? I think what everybody has to realize is that uh, public transit is the great equalizer, all right? Um, it levels the playing field. And it, if, if you are providing access, options, and opportunity for people to get to those opportunities, that's half, you know, that's more than half the battle. Yes, the technology and everything that Governor and, and David speak about is of critical importance, but if you can't get there, what's the point, right? So uh, I, I believe that public transit nationally should be on, on, at the top of the waterfall along with these conversations because it's the critical path forward. Thank you, Robbie. And uh, before we open up to, to the audience, I'll just ask David Westbrook from your perspective, do you, have a, do you have a positive outlook for the future of people who are blind? Well, for, for me and I think for people who have a visual disability, the technological triumph was uh, the, the iPhone and Siri. I think, I think Steve Jobs has done more, whether he did it uh, with inspiration and purpose or not. I think that uh, the Siri and the iPhone, I mean, I get up every morning and read the New York Times and the Washington Post. And I read it faster than you do because I've learned how to speed up the reading clip and uh, you think it's Alvin and the chipmunks, but I can hear it perfectly <laughs> fine. And I don't say that arrogantly. I mean, it's a skill that I've learned. And so I think the technology uh, is going to be absolutely fantastic uh, going forward. But, you know, we have to be careful about, you know, we talk about temporarily able-bodied adults, T-A-B-A, -A, we call them TABA. All of us are temporarily able-bodied adults. If you live long enough, uh, age is gonna catch up with you and cause certain things to be less uh, 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 well-performed as in earlier life. And the other TABA is technologically able-bodied adults and technologically able-bodied adults are people who understand the technology and can have access to it. It's very important when you have a visual disability that you get that access. And the training is not that hard, but you gotta have access and you gotta practice. Yes, sir, please. Critically important for people also to, to realize that you're not alone, right. all right? I was alone. I thought I was alone until you and David Westbrook reached out to talk to me and, and say, hey, exactly what he's saying. Here's what my, and I listened to that phone and I was like, what? Now I do the same thing, right? Having, having a mentor, having people like the governor, David, me, uh, actually, I enjoy when other people come up and talk to me and say, hey, will you talk to my friend? Hey, my, my daughter's you know, losing her vision, hey this. I love doing it, having that mentor type, look, you're not alone, and because that's what I got from you guys, and, and that's what I'm hearing from the governor too. I think that's very special and, and very important. Thank you very much. So uh, we have these three talented, exceptional people. They happen to be blind. Um, I wonder, do we have any questions from the audience? Did they all leave? <laughs> <laughs> if you have a question, please raise your hand and Mike Vietti or I will run the microphone to you. And if you're watching the live stream, please post your question in the chat and we will get to it. All right. I see someone over here. Hi, who has a question? Um, what advice would you give to young blind people? Governor, perhaps we start with you. Stay young. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think that's where I had the greatest struggles. And I think a lot of it had to do with the misperceptions of people around me. And, a lot of things that uh, Robbie and David have talked about as well. But I think what I would most want to instill in young people is that you are equal to everyone in the room. You have the ability, uh, just as they do, it might be expressed a little differently, but you have that ability. And what happens, I think, to a lot of blind people and you know, people with other disabilities is you just uh, start to lose your sense of purpose and your sense of achievement because um, something unfortunate might have happened and you didn't get an opportunity that you should have gotten. 
And so my feeling is uh, uh, just put it out there, make it very clear. Um, if there's services you're not getting, demand them. And uh, people don't always like demands, but at least you know that you've challenged the system or other people or someone else to treat you equally with everyone else in society. I, I think it's critically important to do that because whatever happens, you won't have any regrets about how you could have addressed the, uh, the, the situation. Wonderful. Robbie, you have any comments to add? Sure, real quick. Um, uh, and, and for the really, for the younger youngsters, uh, I like talking to them about how uh, they are just like me and they're a superhero, right? And then I start talking about my spidey sense and, you know, <laughs> allow them to hear that too, and that's fantastic. But I, I think it's critically important that, that the people around them uh, show them that there are people like David, like the governor, um, hopefully they would think of me like that, that, that you can be successful. Okay, and there are people like you, and they are doing this, right? And uh, I think that's critical. David Westbrook. You know, I would quickly add, whenever I talk to young people, depending on their age, I quickly try to establish some empathy with them. I remember when I was in the school cafeteria and somebody at the lunchroom table told me that my uh, hamburger was at 6 o'clock and I put my hand there, it was hot mashed potatoes and gravy. I remember that humiliation. I remember the gracelessness, the self-consciousness, the feeling of awkwardness, how I stumbled, how I uh, retreated, I felt isolated, alone. And those are feelings that are real when you're a young person, whether you're born blind or you've lost your eyesight. You gotta establish that empathy and then you gotta say, it's very simple. Hang in there, keep at it, keep at it. And when you keep at it, you keep practicing, it starts to click and it starts to become intuitive. And life becomes an opportunity, not a hardship. So keep at it. That's what he said to me. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question uh, um, about literature. So um, Harold Bloom writes about um, that blindness is a stimulation uh, in creativity among great writers, so he credits Milton, Joyce, and Borges, um, and he uses the term that blindness helps stimulate in them both verbal richness and a visual clarity. Um, and so I'm just wondering, is this part of the genius issue? <laughs> or do you find that uh, having the concentration and the attention uh, does lend to your uh, visualization and your clarity in expressing that in words. Governor Patterson. So, yeah, I was tested by this doctor once, and he said that I had the second best memory of anyone he tested. And to, you know, prove it, every once in a while, I'll, you know, rattle off a few hundred numbers of pi in order. A but a couple of thousand, my wife says. But the, you know what it really may just be is a focus um, where you're focusing more internally and uh, can, can do a lot of those things. But um, I, when Robbie asked if the audience was still here, it made me think of something I just wanted to share with all of you. I went to the school once and they said, we want you to talk when you get there about government, how it works. So I went in and I'm, People sitting there, and uh, I said, you know, the governor's like the president in a state, and they, they have two houses, like the Congress, the Senate, and the Assembly. Went through this whole thing, and then I asked if anyone to ask any questions. And a teacher asked a question, I answered it. Then another teacher asked a question, and I answered that too. When I got on the fourth teacher, I realized I thought I was talking to students, but I was talking to teachers. <laughs> and I had basically talked down to them. <laughs> and so afterward, I went to the principal and I apologized. And she said, I don't think these teachers know any more than the students do about government. That was a good speech. <laughs> David Westbrook, you want to talk about your genius? Uh, oh, wait. That's my favorite topic. Uh, 
I, I do think when you talk about Milton or other uh, famous blind uh, uh, thinkers and authors, I do think there is something to be said for the strength of learning, the cadence of language, the concatenation of consonants, the consonants, the way you put language together in a, a rhythmic way that captures someone's attention and imagination. And I think that uh, when you're not distracted by vision and those things visual, uh, you do tend to be a little more introspective. And there are great authors who are great, uh, not only because of their content, but because they've found the rhythm of language and they connect with you through that uh, rhythm. I think it's been, for me, a gift. I, I think it's stimulated in me the discovery of talents I never would have uh, discovered. Now, as far as the stereotype of being a better listener or having better memory, you just talk to my wife, Cynthia. She'll tell you I have a lousy memory. <laughs> <laughs> and that I'm not that good a listener. But uh, I'll, I'll take the stereotype on that subject. But honestly, I think, we, I think we developed some disciplines in that area because our circumstances require us to, and we discover a gift from that. Robbie, focus. Yeah, I don't know from a, a literacy standpoint, but from a, a you know, a, as, as David said, I, I, because I don't concentrate on my vision, I pay attention, right? And I don't think it's that my hearing's got any better. I think I just pay attention to it. So, you know, just sitting outside, hearing different birds that I never would have listened to before, right? Hearing different things that I never even thought about before. Smelling the smell of fresh, fresh cut grass or a smoke from a fireplace in the fall. Those kind of things, which I never really paid attention to until now. And, uh, but from a creative standpoint, my son and I he, uh, are learning together how to play the piano, and it's just, it's, it's a joy. It's, mm -hmm. it's fun to do, and I never would have, otherwise I never would have done that. So. Thank you. We have a question over here. Here you are, sir. I was wondering, you hadn't talked about education in the 21st century. Uh, I used to be a mailman, and I delivered the braille packages and the little cassettes. They were cassette things. So I'm wondering, are they still teaching braille? And uh, we had a, a school of the blind in Kansas City, Kansas. I think they moved it to Olathe, but are they, do they even have classrooms for them yeah. now? So I can tell you we have one of our braille national champions is right behind you. So, <laughs> so we do, we do absolutely uh, still teach Braille. But Governor Patterson, you want to talk a little bit about that, about Braille and, you know, and education generally? I am so glad the gentleman asked this question. I was not taught Braille and could have been when I was younger. But this was in the 60s where I think the whole aim of that decade was to, in a sense, visionize people who are actually blind. Try to make them less of an issue uh, or less of a bother to society. And so my parents were told that I could listen to the um, American with the Foundation for the Blind, the talking book series <clears throat> or recordings for the blind that would read uh, your texts in high school and college. But I think I suffered severely because I didn't read Braille because once you started researching um, in other words, you would never be able to listen at the level that you read because Braille really mimics reading. No one really knows why, but the fingers interpret the reading the same way the brain does when you see it. Listening is a different uh, affect and it's 40 to 60 percent less effective than reading. So, uh, you know, when you read something, your chances of remembering it a whole lot better than when you hear it. And for some reason, it was almost a sort of national idea that we didn't really need Braille, which finally got reversed uh, at some point. But it, um, I think, limited uh, opportunities for those of us who were around during that time. But I think now that issue has been resolved and Braille can be restored to a level that it should be in, um, in education. David Westbrook, I, I know you talk to a lot of young people and mentor them, and uh, Braille, uh, I think, is somewhat being supplanted by technology, but I'd welcome your thoughts about it. 
Well, I think the governor's made some extraordinarily important points. I think the younger people uh, who have a visual disability, Braille is, a, uh, is an enabler of a kind of literacy that's really important to you, not only intellectually, but emotionally. Uh, I think as one gets older, Braille becomes uh, what it truly is. It's far less efficient than other technologies are available, so it becomes a convenient form of literacy for finding things, matching things, recalling things. Uh, I'm not so sure that uh, as far as processing a lot of information uh, quickly and absorbing it, that, that Braille is worth the effort if you're 65 years old and have just lost your eyesight, but I think if you're a youngster, very important uh, piece of it, but you don't want Braille to become a way uh, of unintentionally segregating a group so that other means of right. communicating and so forth are, are left out. Yeah. Robbie, any thoughts? Well, I, I think I know who you're talking about, about your national champion back there. <laughs> and uh, she is absolutely fantastic. Is that, am I right? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, like, like, uh, like David said, uh, some, uh, what was funny is the uh, kids who were visually impaired would come to the agency and we'd teach them how to, we'd have a class to teach them how to ride, uh, ride the bus. And, and, and then I got to spend time with them and I'd have them uh, in my office for lunch and we'd eat french fries and stuff. And, and then they would make fun of me and shame me because I didn't know Braille. Uh, and and it's it's fantastic because then I would get letters from them in Braille, <laughs> and they did it on purpose. I know they did. <laughs> and then they'd write on the back, "This is because you can't read this," you know. So yeah. <laughs> so I think we have time for one more question. One more question. <laughs> oh, maybe from Brooke. Uh, hello, um, I'm the Braille girl from earlier that they mentioned. Uh, so, in a lot of interviews like this, I think these are really great um, to hear from people like all three of you who are well established in your careers and your lives and everything. Uh, but one thing that I've noticed a lot of is um, in interviews like this, people will talk about how they're proud to be blind and they're happy about all the opportunities it gives them, but when they were younger, that was kind of a struggle to have a good self-esteem or be comfortable with yourself. Is there anything that you could, is there anything that helped you come to accept yourself as a blind person and not feel any like shame or any discomfort about it because that can sometimes be a challenge for a lot of young blind people. Hmm. Let's go in reverse uh, this time. Robbie, your, your experience is more recent and probably visceral for you. You, you know what, Brooke? I, you are an amazing person, right? You are an amazing young woman and if anybody should be up on a stage, it's you, okay? <coughs> you and, and, and what's, your, what's your mother, I, it's been a true blessing to meet you and your family. And, and to, to have this happen. I, I, to me, and I'm sure they can give you better since, since this happened to me later in life, but it was just my ability, what I really enjoy the most and what gives me pride and what gives me sense of purpose and whatever is, is, is helping other people through that, right? Just like David helped me and Reinhardt helped me and, and, and I think that's a critical path forward, especially someone as brilliant as you, to be able to, to you know, help your fellow classmates and help other people uh, uh, to move forward. You, you don't realize it, maybe you don't realize it, but you, you are one heck of a role model right now. And I think we should all give you a round of applause. For it. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. David Westbrook? Oh, I think. Uh, for me, the key is find opportunities to be of service to others, and if you do that in your life, uh, things are going to work out. And if you do that in a way that brings you a kind of joy, then you're doing the right thing. You've tapped into the right talent. And uh, Brooke, I really appreciate you and, and what you do uh, as a model. And I think those of us who have the privilege of visual disability 
have an opportunity to try to remember, even when we're in a restaurant and we think nobody's looking at us, they are, so you don't get to pick your nose in public. Uh, <laughs> and you've got to be a model, and you've got to realize that that's an opportunity to be a model and, and take on that challenge with joy. And Governor Patterson. Well, I was ashamed of being blind because I was always in environments where everyone else was sighted. And um, I have a little vision, um, and so I would you know, try to play it off. And it never worked. And uh, I, you know, didn't, I felt cursed as if I'd done something in a previous life to deserve uh, being this way. And because I went to public school, I didn't realize how many other blind people were around until I started to get into programs with people. And I think it's one of those things that's um, akin to every young person, Brooke, that you, you have enough insecurities being young and being a teenager and th that whole process, but added to it the fact that uh, that you're blind. It, it, it is a, a difficult period of time. And I remember, you know, a lot of things that happened where I felt embarrassed or humiliated. I think uh, Robbie was talking about, so, or David, one of you said that, uh, I think it was you, David, who said that the, they told you something was at six o'clock and you put your hand and, and it was designed to humiliate you. I remember uh, I was at Syracuse University in a summer program for blind students, but the basketball team was practicing up there and I was sitting across from one of the basketball players. When he finished his meal, he took his napkin and threw it in my plate. Now I saw that and I guess he saw that I took the whole tray and threw it in his face. Now he was like about six foot 10 and I was like, you know, five foot eight on a good day. So this wasn't gonna be a good fight, but I noticed when I stood up that he didn't move. And then when I looked around the room, everyone else was standing. In other words, uh, he was gonna get a royal beat down from everybody in the room. And, but you know, it was one of those situations that was uh, humiliating to me, even now as a college student. And so I think it's just, um, you just have to think. You just have to think of the world a little differently. And I have a proposition for all blind people. That is that the sun is 93 million miles away. It shines on all of us. Uh, photons, which are the uh, packets of energy that capture the sunlight, then transfer it to uh, the brain. And no one knows how that becomes sight. No one knows how the brain interprets that it's a tree that you're looking at or a star in the sky or something like that. So I think we should all take heed in the fact that we know why we're blind, but sighted people don't know why they are. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, I think that's a tremendous way to, to close this. I'd, let's take a moment here and thank the panelists for taking their time tonight. <laughs> tremendous. So I apologize for any weakness I did in, in trying to uh, moderate this, but the full foresight episode featuring Governor Patterson launches on Alpha Point's website at alphapoint.org tomorrow and is available in video and podcast formats. If you or anyone you know is experiencing vision loss, Alpha Point can help. Please, vis please visit our website to learn more. I want to thank the Kansas City Public Library for hosting this event and giving us an opportunity to tell this wonderful story. Uh, thank very much the, our incredible panelists and uh, the governor for, for really uh, starting this series. And thank you all for giving time tonight to listen and learn a little bit about people who are blind. Thank you very much. Thank you.